So here's our delegation, and it was about 32 of us. There were maybe 28 Americans, and the rest are Iranians. There are guides, and I'm going to talk a lot about them. That The guides that we had were, were absolutely wonderful people. And so I really wanted to kind of highlight them instead of put them at the end, because they have all they each have wonderful stories and contribute a lot. You know, many of you might recognize people here, um, Anne Wright, Medea, there's Jody, Pocky. These are folks who, do these people look familiar? Jody, Pocky, a lot of Medea. Um, I don't know where Anne Wright is right there. It was a chance, it was going to be a peace delegation to Iran, a citizen's peace delegation made up of Americans. And the point was to have get some understanding of what life is like in Iran under sanctions, under U.S. sanctions, as well as to let the Iranians know that many, many, many Americans disagree with our government, and we don't think that the sanctions should be in place, and we also don't think that Trump should have walked out of the, the nuclear agreement, okay? Um, and so we, as you can tell, Code Pink, what you might know about Code Pink, it's a women's inspired peace and justice group, and it's very visual. Um, they, you know, believe that there shouldn't be war and that you bring the war money home to spend it on the human needs here. So wherever Code Pink goes, there's really, there's a lot of visual stuff that lets everybody know exactly what we think. And we're giving out, uh, we give out stickers that say peace with Iran in English and in Farsi, and most Iranians speak English. And so they're really encouraged to come out and talk to us. And that was exactly kind of um, what we wanted to see happen. So these are us with our banners. So just to give you an example of Iran and how big it is, um, going all the way up um, in Canada, out to the, the ocean, and often military or opponents of war with Iran say that, you know, Iran, war with Iran would not be a cakewalk. Um, it's way bigger than Iraq and much more complicated. And so here you get a sense of the size of it. Now where we were, uh oh, let's see if this works now. Okay, where, where we went, here's Tehran. So the trip was 10 days. Um, Tehran, we ended up going down to Estefan and then down to Shiraz. Um, this is a very, very long bus rides, okay? And then we flew back from Shiraz to Tehran to get flights home. One of the things that I learned is that um, because of the sanctions, no airplane parts are allowed into Iran. And so why I thought it was kind of cool to walk out in the tarmac and up the staircase to the airport, to the airplane and get on the plane that way, I thought that was kind of retro. I was really naive. And Medea was terrified. She said, these planes have not been repaired in a really long time. And there have been civilian planes that have gone down. <clears throat> so Tehran, of course, is the capital of Iran right now. But Estefan has been a capital at some times, and then Shiraz has been, which, what you'll be able to see, has been a very um, famous city as well. It's a tiny, tiny look in Tehran these 10 days, okay? But this was a whirlwind tour. And so here, are, here were our guides up and close. Um, because part of what I wanted to explain to you is that getting into Iran because of the kind of trip that we wanted to take was very difficult, because we wanted it to be a trip where we could talk to people in the Iranian government, that we could meet with officials, that we could meet with um, you know, schools and see all different kinds of social organizations, and that we could meet and talk with people on the street. And um, the Iranian government had never encountered, let alone Americans, but anybody wanting to come to the country and do that. And so, the process of getting visas was really difficult. Um, and the first time, we thought we were going to be leaving the 1st of January. And all of a sudden, it was, no, you can't go until April. And then in the middle of February, they said, you're leaving in two weeks. So, um, and then at the last minute, they ended up denying three people who were supposed to be on our trip visas, and we'll never know why. But I think it was because they could. This is the Iranian government, the U.S didn't seem to care. And all of this was handled through the Swiss um, embassy and consulate in Washington, D.C., because, of course, we don't have relations with Iran. Americans can only travel to Iran, um, or it, Amer it's called the ABC countries, America, Britain, and Canada. You have to have guides there where you're not allowed to go independently. 
so they monitor you. The other thing is that um, people have been killed in Iran, including nuclear scientists, have been you know assassinated at their homes, and so they had no idea who was really coming into their country. So they were asking questions on the visa forms, things like, have you ever been part of a militia? You know, a lot about what your parents did, what have you ever used any other names, um, and all of that. And so what we um, knew is that some people would be guides, but we also knew that we would be having minders from the government to make sure that we were doing what we were supposed to um, and not stepping out of line, that we all stayed together. There was t totally a lot of concern about this. So we, uh, you know, part of our game was to always try and figure out Oops, who the who the minder was, right? So this is the guy who owned the, the guide service. She's the one who doesn't belong. And these were um, our guides, and they all have stories. You can see how young they all are. Again, this is kind of what Iran is like. And so we figured out this is a guy who's the minder. And um, he um, also told us, it's, look how complicated it is. He makes films in Iran. And he makes films that are kind of an, often in opposition to what government policy is. So he made one on prostitution. He made one on, um, one on uh, I think, a lightweight one on corruption. I can't remember what some of the others were. But when he made one on the inequality between government employees, um, the way they were living, and what their salaries were, then he was arrested and put in jail. But he only was in jail for three months. For some people, that would have been a lot longer, but he would always describe, tell us that he has connections. So they let him out early. And in fact, he was the one who we would go through and kind of um, try and, and shape our itinerary in ways that we were more to our liking when there were things that, or ways they wanted us to, to spend time. Like we never had to go to Khomeini's tomb in, in uh, Tehran. We never went that, which is kind of like an, an official visitor stop that you do. We never had to do that. And Medea and Anne Wright, you know, they were pretty strict about how they wanted us to spend their time, or at least so there was a lot of conversation about it. The other, the other kind of um, minder that we might have is, and I believe that was, um, Muhammad was, th was that, and he was a real, I really liked him. He was, you know, very funny. Um, but he was clearly very religious, and so I think we also had a religious minder, at least one with us most of the time. Um, he, he was so interesting because he got very passionate when we went to Parliament one day. We got to go to Parliament, we had a standing ovation. So this is what happens when you get a government-approved trip. You know, we had a standing ovation of all the parliamentarians for our, our group. Um, and a guy came over and talked to us and talked about how he spent a lot of time in the US and then came back and all the things that he did. And, and this Muhammad was furious about that because he felt like this guy was, you know, he lived in the US rather than be in Iran and he didn't need to live in the US and he was really, really angry about the corruption that goes on in the government now. But at the same time, he really believed in Sharia law and he felt like everything was about protecting the family and that if something happened to the family, there should be huge punishment. And he said, you know, there is a thing called that the, you know, the, the um, especially if there's murder, that the, the relative of the person who's murdered can ask for absolution so that the, the person convicted of murder would not face a death penalty or whipping or things like that. And there was also blood money that um, could pay off or be in, for a crime. And he felt like that, to him, made sense. Um, and it was, so there's a lot of like tension between things that, that are kind of antithetical to what we believe. But he was really funny. He and his wife played a lot of pranks on each other. His son, who was 11, had, was a, a fa you know, fairly well-known chess player who, again, had um, medical issues for which he couldn't get medicine because of the sanctions. You know? um, so there was a lot of gray that went on. You know? There was a lot of gray, a lot of complexity. So all I knew about Iran was that you could go to the beach and see snow-capped mountains in the same day, um, at, from the same place. And so there, it's true, I mean, Iran is surrounded by mountain ranges and has lots of mountain ranges inside um, that are snow-capped, but in the middle, the, here's Tehran, which is just like a, a huge, you know, city. Um, terrible traffic conditions, terrible. This is at night traffic during the day, but very few accidents that we saw. 
Um, this is the Azidi Tower. I wanted to you to see just some of the the architecture to see. Again, you know, it's not like a dour place. You know, there's some really spry things that go on here. Um, so this is the Azidi Tower, which commemorates the um, that uh, 2,500 years of the Persian Empire. And, and you can see where it's, even though it's modern and has a lot of Islamic kind of features in it in terms of the, the ceiling, which is mimics a cave, kind of the top of the cave, with stag lights and stuff like that. You see that a lot in their architecture. Um, and this is where they have a lot of military parades as well as a lot of protests. Um, all right, but Iran, there's also this wild kind of sense of humor in Iran. So in front of this Azidi Tower, there's a statue that I guess somebody you know, erected with permission of a guy taking a selfie of himself in front of the tower. So then, <laughs> right? And so then there's all of us, there's Anne Wright and uh, people that you know. We're lining up along with them to take our own selfies. So there's this incongruity sometimes. It just kind of appears. It really makes you smile. And it feels very human. Um, this is a bridge, this um, a Tabat Tablat bridge, that is a multi-story bridge. It was it's a really beautiful. They told me it was a nature walk, and they wanted me to take it. And it was like, well, why would we go at night? And it's because it goes from park to park, but it's over highways. Um, but it's multi-level. There are restaurants and different things in it. But it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, this is the sixth largest freestanding tower in the world. It's a big radio tower. The first one was in China. Okay, and so then um, to switch to a little bit of traditional kind of stuff because Iran is very, um, very proud of its culture. Um, that was one of the things that I was very... I, I think the things that I really learned, I should have said that, the things that both that surprised me is that one is... Um, as a Westerner, I had no idea of the influence of the history of Iran because I'm Western. Again, I'd forgotten all the history of Iran and the long, the three empires in terms of what made this a really um, incredible culture that makes the Iranians very, very proud. And it's so there's a huge amount of nationalism, you know, in Iran. Um, so the other thing you should know is that like 80 million Iranians, there are lots of them, you know, maybe, you know, 1.8 million or 18 million are somehow connected with a revolutionary guard. So when Trump calls a revolutionary guard a terrorist organization, it has a wide effect in the whole society, you know. Um, the other thing is you should know there are about a million Iranians living in the United States, of over 70,000 who live in Los Angeles, many of whom are either engineers or doctors. So highly educated. The other thing is there was total lack of any kind of security as we would know it. And you'll see some slides of that. I never saw, I saw one police car in a park, but that was all. Um, we were able to, you didn't have any sense of armed guards around. And one of the things you'll be, I think, very surprised, uh, surprised about. Uh, so that was pretty, and I, it was also because I didn't understand the history well enough is that there was that it's a melting pot of many, many cultures and many, many peoples because of its location in the world. And it was on the Silk Road. And so there were a lot of people who came and stayed and they changed languages and all sorts of things a lot, you know. So it's become in some ways a very kind of tolerant or it had in its history kind of organization. The other thing, I mean, and this is that, that I was surprised about. How many people knew that Iran and Iraq had a really bitter eight-year war? Wow. You all are great. See, it had, because it was in the 80s, it was 80 to 88, and for many of us, that was the time that we were dealing with Central America, you know? Um, and, I, and I was raising kids during that time, so that was something... Um, and the trauma of that war, that it's, it stays with this population today, um, is, is, is really, really um, heart, heart wrenching. And we can talk about that. And it certainly affects the way they look at the world and their engagement with the world and their total sense of betrayal of the world for not coming to their aid or not holding Iraq accountable for, for what um, happened. Um, this might look more familiar to you in terms of the architecture. This, you know, you could go down in Tehran. Um, and this is kind of the way a lot of the buildings would look. 
But then, of course, this is a huge apartment building here, and the you know the supreme leader of today. Their portraits are everywhere. Um, this is the Grand Bazaar with the snow-capped mountains in the back, and very very busy. Uh, I don't know how many people have been to a bazaar, but it's wonderful. You can go buy anything you want. Um, and because we were there three weeks before the official New Year's celebration, which is a month celebration just about in Iran, and there are many things that are required to be on the tables at certain different times, and goldfish is one of them that's very um, customary, because I was like saying, why are there goldfish? Um, and the, a tradition of paying to have your fortune told by the little parakeets who go and pick a card, and the card would tell you, you know, what your next year was going to be like. Um, and here is Sama, who you saw, and she was our guide. Um, she was our female guide, and so a group of us were with her in the Grand Bazaar, and we wanted to go to use the ladies' room. Um, it's difficult um, to find Western facilities in most parts of Tehran or even in Iran, so you could be prepared for that. Uh, but we had to cover ourselves from head to toe, and so there was a special room where, um, where we, would, we would put these sheets around ourselves. But at the same time, there are these are bridal shops and just modern shops of dresses and stuff like that. So you really find a lot of um, incongruity and contrast and variety here. I always loved this. This was out in the desert when we went out. Um, and there was a shop that was clearly appealing to the United, to Americans, the few of us. I love it. Uh, local communities are powerful. Em empowering them, I think they meant empower them, buy stuff here. But I love the, um, the idea, the idea of it. This is just a variety of kind of art that I had never seen before. And these are staircases that go up to different floors in apartment buildings. And they're all done in tile. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's gorgeous. So you see a lot of that. And here was one of an opulent restaurant. I think, so I should say that there are two trips planned for this fall for Code Pink. And Ann Wright talks about, people talk about tourism is the best way to make sure we don't go to war, is to get Americans over there to see what it's like. So because we were one of the, you know, we were kind of a special group, so the government really wanted to make sure that we saw the best and we ate the best. And therefore, it was a little more expensive. We convinced them, the guides who, who can make different kinds of tours, that we'd be really happy with something that was less fancy all the time. But, you, but Iranians are extremely proud of their culinary, and their food was absolutely delicious. I'm a vegetarian. It didn't matter. It was just um, it was great. And so even in restaurants, we'd be doing our political work, our friendship work. And this was the owner of the restaurant. And here's a lot of kebabs that you always get. It's just wonderful food. But you could also eat out in the park, get falafel and drink you know, lemonade and stuff like that. Um, so you don't have to be that opulent. We ended up going to, of course, a lot of cultural kind of stuff. And this was a very traditional, thousands of years old cultural kind of event where this guy throws up um, batons that are like up to 40 pounds, and he juggles with them while he's saying prayers and chanting out loud and doing this to a beat of a drum. And there are often eight other guys in that pit with him, and, they're, and he's the leader, and they're all doing what he says um, or, and what he's chanting about, and they're following him. It was amazing to see, and part of the reason I took videos of that is there are many of us who spend time in gyms, and I thought this was really like a whole new take on a gym routine, you know, throwing these things around. And here were some of the musical instruments that those young people were doing, keeping their musical heritage alive, um, outdoor iron work, iron artwork. Of course, um, Iran is very famous in Persia for their gardens that are very, uh, they need to be done in a certain special kind of way. And this is a, a UN heritage kind of garden um, here. And even though this was February uh, and March, this is a kind of stuff. So and these were the luxury, these used to be private homes that now are museums and um, or restaurants and um, stuff like that. So you get a sense of kind of through the history of how folks uh, may have lived. This is another one. And all this beautiful tile work. So, 
And visiting Iran, there's certainly a lot of beauty, you know, and really wonderful things to visit. Now, I don't know if you remember, um, I said Tehran and then worked down and said so we went to Estefan that was halfway down. So there are some famous bridges across a river in Estefan. Um, and, and we went to see them and we stayed in Estefan. But this river is totally dry, if you notice. Um, Iran has had years of a very serious drought, and so any water that they've been able to, that's come into this has been dammed up for agricultural, um, agricultural reasons, and so it just felt like a very bizarre kind of thing. Now, because of Nerus, the new year, they were going to start letting trickles and let the water back in for the holiday season. And actually, I was fortunate they did because after we left, within three weeks from when we got back, Iran was subject to horrible, horrible torrential rainstorms that affected 26 out of their 31 provinces. Um, 78 people were killed, and we'll talk about that. And I have a video of that, and it's, but I think even though it's loud, you might, you know, but if they hadn't let, started letting some of this, that water through, I think in Estefan it would have been worse. Um, so this is the, these are another kind of series of buildings around Government Square, and you'll notice kind of how clean everything is. Um, what we're looking at over there is the Foreign Ministry, and here we're going in to the Foreign Ministry, and we will talk about that as we got we got a meeting, an hour and a half meeting with um, uh, Zarif, who was the Foreign Minister. And we'll talk about how that happened, but we could go right in. There was absolutely no bag check, no screening, nothing. Um, this was this picture of this room was on um, TV recently, I think, with one of somebody visiting. But you can see that there's there's certainly so much pride in the decor. Um, and this was us meeting with Zarif, who uh, is there. I think there are other pictures of him, and I, these are two of his attendants, but there's no, and I'm sure they must have been armed, but there was nothing that prevented us, I mean, there was, you know, we just went right in. Um, and it, I mean, it, we'll talk more about him later on, but I, he, Medea had been at the UN, and she had run into him and said that she had a group of people coming. Um, in like a month or so, and could we could he arrange to meet with us? And so he said, sure. He would really try to make time. She got to to Tehran a day or two before we did, and she went down and found him, and reminded him. And he said, sure. He'd meet with us in the first day we got there. So we got an hour and a half meeting, and he just did this private thing with us. Um, I have a transcript, and we do have a transcript of the whole his whole conversation, which I would be happy to share. He has an absolutely lovely way of speaking, um, and he said that every degree that he's earned, he earned in the United States. So further, further down, this is um, Shiraz, which is the city way, way down south that we showed you. It's, a, it's like it's got a million people in it, and it used to be a beautiful little city. Um, now it's much more middle class. It's known a lot for its cultural, and you'll see some of the beautiful buildings that are there. But I just wanted to show you some contrast with Tehran. Um, this is a place that's considered a really a medical place to go now. I think it's trying to develop medical tourism. So a lot of hair transplants are, are happen there, and we saw a lot of people in our hotel, men, you know, who were, had recently um, were having hair transplants. But as you can see. This is a much more simple, you know, you, you have a person who's doing um, road work. These are pay phones. Anybody seen those lately? So we did, you know, we were down there. And then what we wanted to do was go to the country. We wanted to have a break in routine, didn't want to just stay on the bus seeing these cities. And so Rez, we had to have a big discussion with Rez and say we really wanted to go out to the country. And so he did pull some off for us, you know, to his credit. Um, and this is going through the country, and these are rice fields. Mm. Iran, the government of Iran, the isolationists especially, are trying to make it agriculturally you know, sufficient, food sufficient. Um, so you'd have a lot of this, these rice paddies. A lot of this was wiped out in, a, in the floods that happened several months ago, and it, they can't import food even though food is supposed to be exempt from sanctions. It's, it's not happening, and there are no dollars to do it. Um, this is some more. 
rice stuff, you see the mountains in the back, a lot of desert. So even though you see some main cities, beautiful cities, um, you know, there's certainly a lot of desert and, um, and the mountains are there. And this was the capital, a provincial capital, a little country town. Um, I brought these pictures back because this is rural Iran and you, we think we have rocks in Maine. Um, and contrary to the, you know, the real fancy eating, out here you could, the bed would, bread would be baked over the fire. Um, but Rez got us to kind of a newly trying to, they're trying to develop this kind of eco tour stuff. And so this was a little house, somebody's house, they turned into a little hotel where you could go stay. And, um, and then you, you know, all the food comes and you just roll out the rug and eat on the floor. Um, okay, so to talk a little bit about the history, because that really makes, it's, it's hard, I think, to appreciate, appreciate the nationalism of Iran without, uh, you know, doing a little bit of history. And I know that many of you, um, <clears throat> Many of you know it, but the, but um, this wasn't even the first. So I just want to say that, like, you could see how large it was, though, how extended through the Caspian way out to, you know, through Afghanistan. At one point, it would it would would have take up twenty three countries of twenty three of present day countries. Um, whoops. Okay. So this what this the, in the museums. This was a bowl that was four feet high, and this the the. Mm. The date on it was 5000 BC. Now, I was astounded at that. Here's another one. I mean, this is just a simply beautiful artwork. So the first, the first that we heard about, and that I remember now, is Cyrus, Cyrus, you know? Um, and he built, I can never pronounce it, Pasagarde, which is a, a palace with all the gardens, the Persian gardens. And this is about 550 BC. Um, he was a real human rights, apparently one of the first human rights advocates, and there was a cylinder that's now in Britain of all his human rights laws. He freed um, Jews who were doing forced labor in the, in the communities. He's very famous for religious tolerance, and he gave a lot of his the region's autonomy for self-government. Um, so this was how large his... Um, area was, and you know, the guides are just so proud to point all this out. Very kind of run down, 550 BC now. Um, and so then from there, we went on to Persepolis, which is again down in that area of Estefan, and um, between that and Shiraz. And I mean, I had not paid attention. I took history of art and loved it and loved it and slept through the minute they shut the lights. I was like, but, I mean, Persepolis to me was a, gra a graphic novel as well, right, you know? Um, but here we were at Persepolis, which was um, built by Cyrus's relative Darius. And again, we go, we go with um, our message of peace with Iran. Um, and what I want to read about this, uh, about Darius, just to refresh you all, okay? So his empire extended from India to the Danube. It uh, was the largest empire to date. It had four capital cities, paved roads, canals in the, from the Nile to the Red Sea, um, the prelude to the Pony Express, a standard weight system, gold and silver coins were mined, and he built Persepolis. This was only a ceremonial showcase. It's huge. Um, but people, subjects would come to pay privilege, to pay homage and, um, and to celebrate. So, at Nerus, for example, the emperor would come here and people you know, would all come and pay, hom pay homage to him, as well as to get advice. Um, they built these palaces and gateways, and you can really spend a lot of time here or not. But, one, but the things that I thought were so interesting were the friezes, which depicted kind of the life that was going on then, and the way his subjects would come to pay homage to him. Um, a lot of, this was the staircase up to his throne. And here, if you took a photograph in a certain way, it really looks like a row of soldiers and visitors coming. I felt it's incredibly sophisticated, lovely art, you know. Um, and here he is uh, with his men in waiting and um, his guard is bringing up uh, the visitors. And what I understood about this picture is this guard 
has his hand in front of his mouth, and it's to it's it's a um, it's giving privilege to the emperor and not passing bad breath, his own bad breath, to the emperor, which I thought was pretty astounding. Um, and here in these friezes, you can see if you could, if you were up closer or could see it, they all have different headdresses and clothes on, and they're all waiting in line to see him. But what I thought was amazing was the touching that was going on, you know, between them, um, the hands, shaking hands, and a lot of them are extremely different. And here were the modern day kiddos coming to visit. Um, Xerxes 1 and 2 finished Persepolis and their graves are in the background. And so we are um, again doing our peace stuff and people are coming out and talking to us and this guy in the middle of the tall one is a German. Um, and we talked a lot about you know, the German and Iranian relationships. There's a lot of pharmaceutical companies in Germany. He comes, goes back and forth, but every time he goes back he gets questioned and has to make a lot of um, statements about why he's been and where. So then, um, so even before we get here, which is like the 14th century, in Estefan, which is the second largest open park area in the world of a, a public park, the first being Tiananmen Square in China, uh, where the emperor would sit up there, and he, this would be all the polo matches. Um, down below, and we'll show you a fields uh, where you would do that. Before, between Darius and um, the 14th century, first you had people like Alexander the, the Greek who came and destroyed all of Persia. Um, in Iran, they don't call him Alexander the, the Great, they call him Alexander the Greek um, for obvious reasons. The, the longest empire you know, was the Parthenians and then another one, but the Arabs attacked in 1630, Persian became um, Farsi became, became a language later. Zoroastrianism was given up for Islam with the Arabs. The Turks invaded. The Mongols invaded. But every between these invasions, there would be a rise up of Persian um, tribes coming and establishing new kind of centers like this. And the whole the art and the, the culture would flourish again. So I think that's kind of the testament to how the Iranians feel about their own culture and their way of, of life. Um, and it kind of, so all this time, you know, the Silk Roads were coming, was, so there was a lot of travel throughout Persia during this time. And then you'd have the colonialism the, the, of the UK um, who were beginning to send boats down. And so then the UK and Russia were beginning to really notice Persia. And, um, or t and take interest in Iran. And then, of course, then the colonial trouble started because then for centuries or several centuries, the Russians, the British, and the United States were all kind of vying for, um, for the attention and for their interest, especially uh, in terms of as trade routes. Um, so this is Estefan, the palace. But this, I mean, if you go to Iran, this is definitely part of what you'll see. This was all a polo field. Um, this is kind of this is one of the mosques um, that's on. And all of these tile, every color is a separate tile. And then, of course, wherever we went, we attract a lot of attention, a lot of selfies, and a lot of young people who would would want to talk. Going, we're having lots of discussions. I mean, a lot about corruption of the government. One of the things that I thought I knew was that about Iran is that it was an um, Islamic Republic, and I was told over and over again, or I didn't need to be told over and over again, that it was actually neither. It was not Islamist, it was kind of a corruption of Islam, and um, that it was not Republic because um, the election system is very, very curtailed. And we talk about a lot about how we didn't like each other's or our own governments, but if we could just be together as people, and it was just amazing that we could get along fine, and I think that's what you keep coming up with throughout the world. You'll see a Veterans for Peace hat over there. He's from Connecticut. He was the mayor of one of the towns there. So a Syrian art, um, again, Iran being a Silk Road, had a lot of different kinds of, um, oh yeah. So this was a pink, this is in Shiraz called the Pink, Moss, and I couldn't resist taking this picture. English, free, friendly talks, and nobody's there. But <laughs> I mean, the notion that that might be somewhere in the U.S., you know, I, th I thought was, you know, I, know, now I think we translate, and this is us 
as we always walk down, and I, that's a marker for me, so that we're going to kind of change subjects. So, all right, so now we come to um, Khomeini and um, 1979 and the, and the revolution and kind of the, uh, what we're walking into when we go to Iran today. Um, he's certainly present, um, as, I, you know, as you know, the United States has been very present in, his, in Iran before the revolution of 1979, and, um, and overthrew, was really responsible for overthrowing the Pro Prime Minister Mossadegh in 1953, oops, um, and because Mossadegh wanted to nationalize the oil, and most of the, the oil money was being shipped to, to Britain and to the United States. And so he wanted to nationalize it. For that reason, it was, he was overthrown, and the US installed the Shah, who, was, who did a lot of moder modernizing of Iran in terms of roads and educational system and stuff, and some of the laws. However, he was extremely corrupt, and he was very oppressive. And so the people um, ended up in 1979 having a, a revolution. Now, what's interesting, but before I went on the trip, I went to an Iranian um, conference in DC, and it was really, the whole title of it was 1979, The Revolution, because it, it feels, and there were a lot of US government, think tank, academics there, truly trying to make sense out of what happened with this revolution, and how did it happen that the Islamists ended up on top. It, looked, from what I understand, is that there are three main components, the students, who, um, who uh, the communists, and the Islamists, who were really revolting against um, the Shah. And um, when the Shah you know, uh, didn't, the United States really supported, if they were going to support one group, they were supporting the Islamists. They were definitely not going to support the communists nor the students. So in 1979, Khomeini won, and the, United, the students, the Shah went, he left the United States, and the students were extremely concerned that he was going to come back, that, that he, was, he would come back to Iran. And so they, this is all the, um, a lot of prison stuff. So they took over the U.S. Embassy, you know, with all the employees in there, and the U.S. Embassy now has been turned into the U.S. Den of Espionage Museum. <laughs> uh, um, we were not allowed to go there. Um, I think clearly our trip by the government was, a lot of it was for, for in, in, you know, internal kind of um, consumption. And, you know, we were on, on the news all the time in Iran. And I think, but this particular thing is that, that that Iran did not want the United States to see us being at an espionage museum. So we weren't allowed to go there. But actually, Barbara Wright, one of us, stayed a few days later, and she went, and she said it was only three rooms, little rooms, and one was a kind of an open safe. It was pretty disappointing. So as I said, the other thing that when you, 1979, you know, the revolution happened. Um, uh, the students took over the embassy, and then and Iraq declared war in Iran. Um, over a million Iranians and about 400,000 Iraqis uh, died during this period, and um, it, it's still a huge trauma in in uh, in Iran. And part of what you see is the military museum um, or the gravestones. And we met parents of, of soldiers who had died, you know, 30 years ago, who were still coming every day. And then uh, this. Part of the reason the, that the, this war was so tragic is the amount of chemical weapons that were dropped on Iran. And many of those were supplied by the United States. And the United States supplied a lot of the intelligence on where to, uh, to drop them. So there were seven different, uh, I think it was seven different appeals made to the UN and reports drawn up about what was going on during that time uh, with chemical weapons and the UN didn't do anything um, until 20, 10, 20 years after the war did they come out with a report and this is again why the Iranians feel so betrayed in some ways by the international community as well as by the United States. Um, Zarif would tell us later that he feels like 
the, that the world kind of turning its back on Iran during this time is one of the reasons that they ended up starting to decide to enrich uranium for their own civilian nuclear um, structure in, in, in Iran and became feeling like being an isolationist was much more important. But everywhere you go, in, well, certainly Tehran, Estefan, and Charisse, you'd find these paintings all over buildings. You'd find tile work. I, I took pictures of a lot because I really wanted to kind of honor them um, and the incredible you know, sadness that it just has still continues to befall the country. Um, they're not all that many older men that you see who are able-bodied. You know? um, again, a lot of the population is very young. I think what I was doing here is trying to, I was trying to figure out where to put this picture. Um, but part of what I told you is that there was the nuclear scientists that were killed. It was another reason that um, there's such a concern about the outside world coming into Iran. Um, and this was the mother and the daughter of one of the scientists who Rez, I'm sure, arranged us to have dinner with because he could arrange. And we got soccer stars, we got film stars, we got everything. But we, we and as well as um, folks like this. And she was great, the daughter. She's about 12 now. And she, um, speaks unbelievable English that she learned from, um, from watching television. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure to get their picture in too. Mm. Um, so, and this is what you see Iran kind of living with today. Those are all American bases surrounding Iran. Mm. So we talk about, you know, um, Iran being surrounded by Ameri American bases currently under huge economic warfare through sanctions, um, that we have these false flag operations going on, and um, uh, you know, as well as a lot of other kind of sanctions and things that are going on and de continually being demonized by the United States, and they're in a, just a very very tough position. And um, you can I can understand two things. One is there's a reason to trust the outside world. And secondly, you know, what is their um, what is their future? I mean, I feel like they're, you can see where the strait of her, this right here is where all the, a lot of the concern is right there now. Um, and I've just been reading in some ways, thanks to our military, in some ways, that mi the military, and I'd be interested in Bruce or what other people think about this, just one thing that I'm reading is really, um, holding Trump and a lot of his government people back from any kind of a military strike and escalation there. And even though, for example, Trump and Bolton said, you know, there's going to be an aircraft carrier going and all this other stuff going now, the aircraft carrier um, admiral said we're not going into the strait because he don't, they don't want to be provocative. You know, so you have decisions that are being made on local levels, lo smaller levels as to how to try to contain this. but. Um, imagine kind of trying to live with that around you. Mm. So, so what I want to talk a little bit about now is our trip. And again, part of why we ended up being able to go, I know, is for internal, um, you know, for the population there, for them to see that the government was trying to do something and Americans were coming and take pictures of us and seeing all the things that we were doing. And so for that reason, we were interviewed a lot and we had to give a lot of press conferences. Um, and we were a lot, there's Ann Wright being interviewed. Um, here we are at, um, at a radio station. There's Jody and Ann and a professor from California at a university, uh, press TV, that we're having discussions. There's me with, um, it's interesting that many of the graduate students, especially this is an American program, um, they're women. Most of them are, are women who are in the graduate program. They speak incredible English. This woman, she was like 23, and she's spoken before the UN on international law. She's, she wants to be an international lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the places where I was really interested in where the government wanted us to go that we didn't particularly want to go, and they said that this was a, we thought it was a museum, and what it was was a huge exhibition hall showing the, the, the programs, the welfare programs that the government supported. Um, 
I, there is, I think, a strong current in Islam about taking care of your own and welfare and, and giving up a certain amount of your money for those who are in need. And so certainly their job programs were being touted here, a lot of for, um, work and jobs for women who had lost husbands um, during the war, a lot of anti-poverty stuff, but it was, it was, we were seen in this big exhibition hall is where we got to look at it all and see all the models. So they wanted us to stay there a much longer time than we did. But, um, so, I don't know, I, was, I thought it was interesting and it made me think about where, what would the United States want us to see? What would our government, if there were two things the government wanted us to see, what would they be? Um, I don't know if it would be our social welfare programs. But the other thing, the next one, is that they wanted us to go to a nuclear plant. And um, that was pretty interesting. There are no pictures of the nuclear plant. I think, and it was like, why would they want us to go to a nuclear plant? Oh, Martha's telling me to get over it. Um, why would they want us? And we had to dress in the white you know, suits and the hair and shoes and stuff and get radioactive and walk around the inside and see where the, you know, the isotopes were and how they described the whole running of the plant to us. And um, we didn't understand much of it because a lot of it was in pretty broken English, nor why we wanted to be there. I, I really, in retrospect, I think it's because they wanted us to see a civilian use of nuclear power. Um, I don't know, and that that was going to their media and uh, perhaps around the world, and because we certainly wouldn't be able to tell if they were doing anything with military grade stuff, but there was a student there who had a nuclear plant on his campus, a little nuclear reactor, and said that his, his nuclear reactor, Reed, was way more sophisticated than what we saw. And then of course MIT and many of our colleges have these, and they're used for, um, for medical and research purposes, I guess. But this particular nuclear reactor that we saw is on the hit list for the United States is going to bomb it. And I just want, I want you to see the security, because we could see the security. Isn't that unbelievable? So we, we could see the security. Here we go. And um, this is the military budget of Iran is $16 billion. Ours is $700 billion. Um, and then we went to a school, um, Rez, this was kind of his foundation. And most of these, the students here, um, were Af Afghan refugees. He, we were warned coming in, a lot of this is just so interesting, that these were kids, you couldn't take their pictures, they were very, you know, they would be scared in our presence, they would be anxious, they might not um, be very friendly towards us, you might see a lot of scars, because they were really basically street kids. And um, they had, they were, there were two elementary schools and that there was a tech high school and then a really good vocational program. So I think, I don't know if we actually knew what we were gonna see, or what was gonna, we were gonna see, but here, um, these are some of the girls. And here, it was very rudimentary, but incredibly well done and based on a lot of very, very forward-thinking U.S. educational philosophy. They had a bell outside the principal's office that any time any student was pleased or happy about something they could do, they could go and ring that bell. Oh. I mean, that is just was so cool. They had um, certainly places where they could resolve their conflicts by talking and, um, uh, but this was, if you wanted to be on TV, this was kind of a thing they made. So that was very creative, you know. Uh, it was very creative, and here was a yogurt making machine that these are two volunteers demonstrating, and these are little girls. Um, I, I wanted to go and sing to them, and we organized our little song of, you know, if you're happy and you know it, stamp your feet or whatever, and so they wanted to sing back to us, but I'm afraid it'll be really loud. And we had no idea what they were singing, but it was on the same kind of, but these are clearly, these kids were, you know, we walked all over the school, they seemed happy, it was a, a you know, and they, instead of us, you know, not being able to touch them or look at them, or there is a little girl sitting on Medea's lap. So we, it was much more comfortable than we, you know, than we thought. Um, we, we got a lot of visitors. This guy was part of the mayors in um, Tehran. He was in the cabinet and he was a cultural um, minister. And he talked about being in the U.S., again, U.S. studying law, he heard about the, the war starting in Iran. He came back, <clears throat> joined the military, and he was held captive in Iraq for 
I, th I think, three or four years and came and then stayed in Iran, um, talking very much like an isolationist, that there was no point in being engaged with the world, uh, which is certainly part of it. Then we went to the Peace Museum, um, which is where you saw that thing about the chemical weapons. And it was an amazing, amazing place. This is a, a woman, a physician uh, who is involved in human rights, and she is bringing her children to learn about uh, war and, this, and um, uh, you know, the chemical weapons that were used. So it's certainly a part of the history. Um, here is Barbara. So the, again, it's during the 80s, another thing that, that has happened that we don't hear about much is that the United States shot down a civilian airliner, an Iranian airliner, 280 passengers. Um, and so when you hear about Trump and his drone, you know, we were going to retaliate because a drone got shot down that was probably in their airspace. And no mention of any, any of this stuff, you know, of the civilian, of the airliner that we shot down of theirs. And that Bush refused to apologize, even though it went to international court and there was a compensation was awarded. The, and so here, Barbara, she's in California, a member of Code Pink. And so she had a book drawn up and, uh, or made, and each of the victims of the airline uh, shoot down was his or her name was posted in there. There was a lot of poetry in it and we all signed it. So it was kind of our apology on behalf of the United States people um, that we gave to the Peace Museum. Yeah. The guy in the right, um, he suffered a lot from mustard gas and talks about how you know his breathing is impaired, his eyesight is impaired. Um, he 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 can't he needs medicine to make his tear ducts work but now because of the sanctions so he talks about the irony you know this all this injury happened because of american weapons the medicine he needs comes from the uh, united states and now because the sanctions are there there um, he can't get that medicine and here ann wright is presenting a veterans for peace t-shirt to them also for their um it gets really uh you know for their museum for and then we sat around and we, we did rounds of Dona Nobis Pachem singing. And it was just so beautiful. Um, the man who's the director who lost his legs said that this was like one of the happiest days of his life. That he was just, um, he was just so touched by, by our presence and the gifts. Uh, and certainly would have to kind of go back. And it's certainly, I mean, I can't imagine in this country um, having that there should be a peace museum as well. Can I turn this on for a second? This is the floods. Can I? Do you all want to see the floods? Because this is again, I think, um, if I, it just could be very loud. Oh my God. Whoa. I guess there's no sound. That's just better, maybe if it's, I mean, the force of that and. Was that when you were there? No, it was like no, two no. weeks after I came back. Oh my God. Sorry? We were just back for two weeks. So this is in the beginning of their... No, one of, I asked one of the guides, I said, could you send me some videos? You know? I just felt like, I don't, this just lost. Oh, because that's all. Water coming in from a river? Yeah, coming, yeah. So, um, so I, wow. I found, and of course, was this ever in any of the papers in the U.S.? I don't know, I don't know what happened to it. Um, so this is, I just wanted to, Gosh, so I hope I told you everything I really wanted to. Um, cause, so I think you get an idea about the sanctions and that, that Trump had, I think we should, you know, we could talk about the foreign policy and what can happen after this, but, um, you know, in kind of a Q&A kind of thing. But with Zarif, um, as I said, you know, his, the pressure on him 
is to show that engagement with the world and especially with the West is, is worth it. He talked in detail about a lot of the, the um, negotiations for the nuclear deal with John Kerry, who I really hope at some point tells us a lot more than he has. Apparently, John Kerry has been back to Iran on the sly and said, just try and wait Trump out. But that's becoming increasingly kind of difficult. Um, so his point was is that Iran's biggest crime against the United States was its desire to be independent. Yeah. That um, Iran is the only country in that whole region that doesn't belong to a military alliance, you know, that is totally responsible for its own self-defense. Um, he also pointed out, or one of his, I thought it, an important point was that the US is totally focused on Iran as an Islamist state, as opposed to uh, uh, being focused on the nationalism that is among the people there and is so much a part of the culture. He said, um, and again, as I, I, I said before, is that that Iran was led to deciding to do nuclear enrichment in the 1990s because of, again, its repeated failures with engagement, the failure of alliances or failure of allies to rally. And so, of course, now you have that Trump left, and I know you all know this, Trump left the, the nuclear deal, that they put more and more sanctions on Iran, and now are, are punishing any of the other countries who signed the, the nuclear deal or who have any kind of business arrangement with Iran. So, strang you know, really um, strangulating all sorts of positions, okay? He talks about the exaggerated role that US and the media have given Iran versus, this is interesting, um, um, Hezbollah and Hamas, because it allows US to portray Iran, not Saudi Arabia, as a chief sponsor of Islam extremism and terrorism. And again, he says it allows the world to justify Israeli policies um, with respect to Hamas as, as opposed to their responsibility with the emergence of Hamas, okay? And their aggression, their taking of the Golan Heights. So there, there's a lot of uh, reason to to keep blaming to Iran that extends beyond um, Iran. Oh, and the other thing that he talked about a lot is the civilian. And actually, I was asked by um, Senator King's office or Senator King himself to write some kind of report about how the civilians see the sanctions. And um, it's I put it off a lot. And I think I'm going to go to the office and, and talk to them some more because he talks about. Um, how the civilian opinion with respect to, to any alliances with the West or international alliances has really dropped significantly since Trump le has been leaving the deal. And who, uh, many, many Iranians feel like there's no point in sticking into negotiations mm -hmm. because they don't believe that there's any reason to believe that the international community will abide by its um, by its. Uh, uh, you know, by any of its commitment. He feels like the, the kind of the isolationists are, are winning out at this point and that there's absolutely no incentive for Iran to be engaged in, um, with the West. So I have like two asks for action. Clearly no war with Iran. Secondly, I think that we have to come to terms as American people with sanctions or what's really economic terrorism that we're leveling against so many governments and it's really devastating the civilians. You know, the wealthy can, ha can hide their money, um, but the civilians are the ones, whether it's in Iran or Venezuela or Cuba, continued. Um, and that this is kind of a part of American policy that we just don't protest enough, you know, it's not really there. The only other thing that I wanted to say that waiting in the wings to, to believe that they should be the rightful government of Iran and that are getting more and more support from the US government, especially John Bolton, is the MEK. And the MEK, and I can never remember what that means in, in um, Farsi, but it used to be a, on the terrorist list of the United States. and. Um, and they, they in the um, during the Iraqi Iranian war, they went in and and um, did a lot of terrorist operations against Iranian people. They're thought to have been trained to take out to kill the nuclear scientists. Uh, 
But in Washington, when I was in Washington, and thank God for Code Pink because they're so on top of this, and we went to all the congressional offices. This is like the new APAC. They've got tons of money from Saudi Arabia um, and can wine and dine all the congressmen and throw it around. And so it's something that we have to really caution our, our congressional delegations to be very much um, on the lookout for because they have absolutely no relevance in Iran and they would never be accepted. So I think that's it. Mm. <laughs>